We're four friends with hot takes on food media. And we're here to review and recap all kinds of food shows in bite-sized seasons. Plus, virtual potlucks, cooking adventures, and food memes. Welcome to Pot Appetit Gourmet Takes. Hello, and welcome to another exciting Reddit talk here on r slash food. My name is LJ, or Little LJ, here on Reddit, and I'm here with my co-hosts, Meg and Justine, and we will be your hosts for this Reddit talk today. We're also the hosts of Pod Appetit Gourmet Takes, a podcast that reviews and recaps all kinds of food shows in bite-sized seasons. You can find us on your favourite podcatcher. But today it is truly our absolute pleasure to welcome Molly Bars as our guest to today's Reddit talk. Molly Bars is a cook, recipe developer, cookbook author of a cookbook that I own and love, Cook This Book, weenie dog lover, sea sal, Caesar salad enthusiast and video host formerly of the Bon Appetit Test Kitchen. And Molly has a lifelong love of cooking, eating, and teaching other people how to cook. Um, So thank you, Molly, so much, first of all, for being here. We are all massive, massive, huge fans at Pod Appetit, so we're really excited to talk to you, as I'm sure the um, r slash food members are to hear from you today, too. So today, Molly will be answering your pre-submitted questions all about Thanksgiving. We have had a sticky post up in r slash food for a while asking for you guys to submit your questions to Molly. So we will be working our way through those. If we run out of those, we will also be taking questions from the comments of the pinned Reddit post for this talk. So if you did not get a chance to pre-submit, don't worry. Please add your comment and we will do our best to get to your question. So our first question is from uh, Everborn. They have asked, for someone who doesn't have an oven and a small kitchen, is there a Thanksgiving set of dishes that you would recommend, Molly? Um, They're basically looking for a meal that encompasses the feeling of the holiday, but unfortunately without a turkey. Oh, a great question. I'm going to assume that person has a four-burner stove um, and a as in a cook of sorts, in which case I would say, obviously we're going to forego the turkey. There's no sense in trying to do a turkey stove top. Chicken doesn't feel as fun. I would probably recommend a, like a big fat ribeye steak or like a celebratory cut of meat that you could easily cook stove top and then sort of build a meal around it. So like, so if this were me, I would make a, bone-in ribeye on one of my burners. Um, I would do either a mashed potato or some sort of crispy potato occupying a second burner. I'd do a side of creamed greens or like blistered green beans, some sort of green veggie side on the third burner. And then um, a salad to round out the meal. I'm assuming this meal isn't feeding 10, 20, 30 people. So you probably don't need more than three or four dishes. So I would kind of go into like upscale, fancy New York steakhouse vibe for this one. Is that tuna that we hear in the background, Molly? Um, it, I don't think so. Because oh, I thought I heard it. I thought I heard a little dog. <laughs> <laughs> um, she'll be back. She's out on a walk right now. <laughs> well, um, I'm sure everyone wants uh, you to say hi to Tuna for us. I know I do. <laughs> I will. I will. All right. Our next question was submitted by Bike Buyer, and they ask, does a salad belong on your Thanksgiving table? And if so, what type? Okay. This is a big one and an important one, and I feel like one that really overlooked. Thanksgiving meals are notoriously heavy and they're fatty and they're rich and there's actually like very little acid involved in most of the like classic Thanksgiving dishes. So if you think about mashed potatoes and gravy and turkey and stuffing and green bean casserole and creamed corn, none of these dishes have acid or lemon juice or anything bright. And so actually for me, the salad is maybe the most important 
part of the meal because it's the foil to everything else. And so I would probably recommend not a, um, not a fatty, like not a Caesar salad for once. This is maybe not the moment for the sea salad um, because again, that's another rich fatty salad, but I would recommend something really acidic and bright. So like a, a sherry vinegar dressing or a white wine or red wine vinegar dressing with lots of mustard and shallots and, right, sort of like biting elements that will cut through. I would recommend using a sturdy lettuce because as we know, Thanksgiving dishes sit out at room temperature for hours and you go back for seconds. And if you use a light, gentle lettuce, like a butter lettuce or an arugula, they will wilt by the time round two comes around. So thinking of things like radicchio and kale and escarole, which can stand the test of time. And then I usually like to put something sweet in the desserts because just in the same way that everything on the Thanksgiving table is rich and fatty, it's also very, very savory, um, aside from maybe a sweet potato casserole. And so putting like an apple or a persimmon or, or a dried fruit or something in the salad that provide some sort of sweetness to counterbalance all of the rest of the savoriness would be my recommendation in the salad department. Speaking of sweet, uh, this question came anonymously. What is your go-to cranberry sauce recipe? Um, I do it different every year. So I don't have a recipe, the recipe. I also don't use a recipe. Um, Cranberry sauce is usually like the last minute thing that I'm throwing together and um, I will just sort of muscle my way through it and taste my way through it. So using um, frozen cranberries and some balance of sugar and citrus. And so like if that means if that I have blood oranges that happen to be lying around or there's lemons or limes. I'll use the zest and the juice of both of them and sort and and any kind of sweetener. So it could be sugar, could be maple syrup, could be honey. Cranberries are obviously very tart and you can sort of cater this to your own palate. So if you are someone who really likes sweet things, you add more of the, the sugar element. Um, if you um, are have a tart kind of sour palate, keeping it on the more sour side means leaving some of that sugar out. But basically all you're doing is throwing a sour element, a sweet element, and a bunch of cranberries in a pot and bringing them up to simmer. They come up to a simmer really quickly because they are they have so much water in them. They will burst, the water will cook off, and then they will start to become really jammy. And so you can really sort of just create your own recipe here. If you want to put a cinnamon stick in there, if you want to put fresh sliced ginger in there, if you want to put star anise you can kind of um, add other ingredients and elements to it, but the basics are just sort of like tasting your way through this balance of sweet and sour. That's a really good tip. I um, make my own cranberry sauce, Molly, so um, I I like to hear different ways of doing it. Um, Moving on from from cranberry sauce, we had a um, question about um, green bean casserole. Uh, So Dr. Diamond has asked, what's your take on a green bean casserole dish. Is there a substitute recipe you'd recommend if someone isn't crazy about the canned version in their past? Um, Okay, so first of all, green bean casserole was never a staple on my table um, growing up. However, um, I have had really superlative versions of it that don't use um, creamed canned vegetables. And so basically, like if you think about what a green bean casserole is it's sort of like a think of a potato gratin but instead of potatoes you're putting green beans and other aromatics in it so it's cooking in like a thick creamy sort of bechamel sauce and so um there is a recipe um the recipe that i know and know have loved in the past though it's never made its way actually to my thanksgiving table as i said um is on bon appetit and it's bon appetit's best Um, green bean casserole and so it uses it makes basically a creamy bechamel sauce with butter and flour and milk and cream and you sort of pour that over 
the um, pour that over the green beans. And so it's a way to create that like really rich, bubbly, thick, um, creamy concept without using canned vegetables. So sort of like a fresher uh, take on it. I'll have to try that someday. Uh, it's going to be hard for me to go outside of the box of canned green beans, but I promise I will. <laughs> <laughs> I think I like it. I really do. Nice. All right. We have a submitted question from a real cool dad who asks, what's the best water to have on the table? Ice water <laughs> with lemon, plain or some ice water with cucumber slices. What do you think? Mm, interesting question. <laughs> um, I think that um thanksgiving is a more is more type of holiday so if your guests um are the type of guests who have specific water preferences i'd say put them all out there um, i personally am a flat cold water person i like water that i like ice water i do not like bubbly water because i feel like especially in the context of a large meal bubbly water just fills me up and takes up space in my belly that I'd rather save for food. Um, but I don't think that you really need to choose a, a water POV. I think this is a an area in which you go for it and just put a pitcher of each kind. And if you want to go even further, maybe make them seasonal by doing a pitcher with blood sliced orange in it, a pitcher with... Um, sliced garlic, one with lemon, like really go for it if you're going to go for it on the waterfront. Water preferences. Who knew? Who knew? That would be a big Uh Yeah. So we have a question now from server Sam and they say, looking for a mashed potato recipe that actually stands out. Any suggestions? I do have a suggestion for you um, because I just developed a mashed potato recipe this year and it's called i call them cloud potatoes they're sour cream and onion cloud potatoes and they're called cloud potatoes because they are light and ethereal and not stodgy and thick and that's thanks to no less than five types of dairy that are in them um and actually there is a video a youtube video coming out today or tomorrow TBD, depending on my posting schedule, that's going to walk you through the recipe. Um, it's a recipe that's from my recipe club, but basically you start with Yukon gold potatoes, which are um, a creamier, buttery, butterier option, um, better for mashed potatoes than like a russet potato, which is better for roasting. Um, once they're boiled, you mash them with an infused kind of garlic milk and then you add butter, sour cream, and chives and scallions. You mash them all together, you throw them in a baking dish, and you let them cool to room temperature. And once they're room temperature, you whip a bunch of heavy cream, like medium stiff peaks, and you fold cheese into the heavy cream. So it's unsweetened cream, it's just heavy cream with a little salt and pepper that's been whipped air and aerated you spread them over the top of the mashed potatoes in the baking dish and you return it to the oven you put it in there at like 400 for 20 minutes or until the tops get brown and what happens in the oven the layer of whipped cream sort of like starts to deflate and soak into the mashed potatoes and it lightens them up and gives them this like really soft fluffy like potato puree type of texture and then the cheese that's in there brown so you almost get this mashup of like a potato gratin and the world's fluffiest mashed potatoes it's a very very special um mashed potato dish and especially um useful on thanksgiving because you can prep the entire thing ahead so you can make the mashed potatoes ahead you cool them down you can whip the cream ahead you can spread the cream over and then transport your potatoes wherever you are going. They're ready to go and you pop them in the oven. So sour cream and onion cloud potatoes. It's up in the club at mollyboss.com and a YouTube video will be coming out in the next 24 hours walking you through exactly how to do it. Oh my God, that sounds amazing. <laughs> 
literally trying not to drool all over my keyboard. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, gl I'm glad you mentioned timing though because um that's the subject of our next question it was an anonymously submitted question but it's all about timing um they say timing the dinner so that everything is finished and ready to eat at the same time can i make things ahead of time and then warm them up in the oven while the turkey is resting or should i make everything from scratch thanksgiving morning um they they, they sound like they just need a little bit of advice on what's good to make ahead so any any advice you have molly um yes my advice is do not make everything day up that um sounds like a disaster um do the thing about most of the dishes on the thanksgiving table is they're sturdy and they're hearty and if chosen and executed correctly can really hang out for a while so your potato gratin can be made in advance your stuffing can be made in advance you, you can build everything up to the point that like they get their final broil or toast in the oven and so all of that stuff can be done day before even you can make your stuffing mix keep it in the fridge and then dump it into a baking um a baking sheet or a baking dish dot it with butter throw it in the oven um creamed greens is a great example something that could be made you know two days three days in advance transfer it to a tupperware and then day of just reheat the pot um really gently mashed potatoes as we just discussed um are easy to make ahead when you make them ahead the way that um i explained just a few moments ago um, your salad, you can wash, prep, clean, dry your greens um, in um, damp paper towel, some kind of resealable container, inch. make your head two or three days in advance. Day of, all you have to do is slice up some persimmons or apples or whatever you're throwing in, maybe chop some herbs and toss it all together. Um, I would say the thing really the only element that really really and truly has to be cooked day of is the turkey um and so doing all of this other stuff in advance will give you space to do that your pies can be done in advance your cranberry sauce can be made in advance even your gravy can be made in advance because there's um there are plenty of ways to make gravy that don't rely on the drippings of the turkey um and if you make a really rich, flavorful turkey stock using the wings and the neck and the um, and the giblets, all of those elements that come with the turkey actually make it into your turkey can be used in advance to make a really rich turkey stock and then turned into gravy. And you can make that entire element days in advance and then day of when you're reading in a pot you can whisk in any turkey drippings um that come out of the oven that you don't want to leave behind but you don't need to wait for all of them uh you don't need to wait for all of it to be done all a minute which is you know the most stressful way to run a thanksgiving so i would say yes to prepping everything in advance I really appreciate that question. And I'm definitely taking notes over here because I'm the one hosting Thanksgiving this year for 10 people and I better get started today, it sounds like. Today, so it's Tuesday. We are four hours out from Thanksgiving, um, which means the prep should begin if it has not already. And um, because I don't know if this is the question that's gonna come up, but I feel that it's an important piece of information for everyone to know. Turkeys should be brined two days in advance of when you're going to cook them so today is the day to season your turkey we're 48 hours if you wait any longer your turkey will be less than seasoned um, and so it's a really really important step to season your turkey 48 hours before so when we jump off this ama everyone's going to go and then we're going to talk we're all going to enjoy really juicy moist well-seasoned birds on thanksgiving I will definitely be doing that. That's the first thing I'm doing after after we're done chatting with you. And speaking Good. of turkey, we have a question from Scarfsa. And they ask, what is the trick for the crispiest skin on a turkey? And how can I apply this to a roast chicken later? Okay, so 
Here's the thing about a whole bird, whether it is a turkey or a chicken, or for that matter, a squab or a pigeon or any kind of poultry in its whole form, it, cooking it whole traps the moisture into the bird. And as, after it's done cooking, as it's sitting and resting, as you know, you have to rest a turkey before you carve it the moisture recirculates and all the juices recirculate and deflate the skin and and moisten it to the point that it loses its crispiness. There's just so much steam inside the cavity of turkey that's just trying to get out when you rest it. And so from my perspective, chasing the dream of crispy turkey skin on a whole roasted bird is worth doing because it ultimately almost always sucks out. It doesn't mean that the skin won't be delicious. It just means that like, if we're going for that shattery, crispy skin, roasting a bird whole is not the answer. That said, I also, for other reasons, believe that roasting a bird whole is a inadequate way to treat the turkey and that actually the best way to do a turkey is to break it down into its parts. So breaking, butchering it into its breasts, its legs and its wings before it gets roasted. And that way you are able to pay attention and, and pay, pay close attention to the doneness of the breast, the doneness of the legs. You can pull the breasts when they're done and leave the legs on for longer. So not one part of the turkey ends up getting sacrificed for the other. And so while it's while it's a great technique in terms of making sure that your turkey is properly cooked, also allows you to do is have crispy because it's not sitting in that large mat as it rests. And so there's a lot less moisture that's trying to its way out in a steak after it comes out of the oven, you will end up with a spear skin. So I always if I'm breaking my turkeys down in advance, which is what I'll be doing this year, I open them at a low temperature in the oven, so like at a 300 in their parts on a baking sheet. Um, and that allows for the skin to render its fat out and it will drip down on, you'll put it on top of a, a wire rack and the, the fat will drip out, which will allow the skin to crisp. And... Um, and you'll do so only like an hour before the you before you want to eat. So it's a really great way also to avoid having a turkey occupy the oven for four hours on Thanksgiving Day. So I really highly recommend the pre-broken down turkey approach. And if you're about to season your bird today and you were thinking about roasting it whole, I really, really urge you guys to break it down you can look up a video online if you don't know how to do it. If you haven't picked your turkey up already and you're planning to pick it up today, the best thing to do is to ask your butcher to break it down into its parts for you. Um, and they'll do all the heavy lifting. Um, and you can still take your neck and your and your and all your innards and wings and things with you, but have someone break it down so that um, you can have both properly cooked turkey meat and crispy skin. Now, AG left a comment a question for you molly that's about one of your youtube videos and they ask does your brother actually think celery were called fennel sticks or was that an act <laughs> it's not an act um no we are not actors adam's not an actor he's just kind of a bozo um he does not know how to cook he doesn't really um have an awareness of like ingredients and flavors and and or techniques and so so yeah he saw he saw celery and he thought fennel sticks and that is why we love adam and that is why we um we need to teach adam how to cook so hopefully he'll be back on another episode and we can get him up to snuff because i can't have a brother who can't tell the difference between fennel and celery <laughs> I have two brothers and um, they are also kind of bozos as well so <laughs> <laughs> bozo <laughs> brothers <laughs> I think it's just a thing <laughs> yeah um so uh I have a question from another anonymous uh user who have, 
who has submitted this um, about the turkey again. Um, what do you do with the giblets of the turkey? Um, they say that they are believers of using all of the bird, but they're just not really sure what they're supposed to do with this part of it. So, Okay, so the giblets of the turkey are great um, for reinforcing your stock. So today is another great day to make your turkey stock, which will ultimately make its way into your gravy. And there's no reason not to use them in it. So I have a recipe actually that I developed um, a couple of years ago. I think it's called Why Is It So Good Gravy? Um, so if you, you should find it. And um, while it doesn't call for giblets, you could you can add easily add them to it if you want to use every part of the bird and you like the flavor of like offal and innards. And so basically this recipe will have you roast turkey wings and bones and you can add the giblets at that point to the skillet and kind of let it brown and cook through. And then you'll pour water over it um, with a bunch of aromatics and turn it into like a really rich turkey broth and the giblets will drive home that like very deep kind of savory turkey flavor. So if that's something that you're into, there's no reason not to use them. They'll cook for quite a time um, when you're making this en enforced stock that then you thicken into a green. So at that point, I would discard them. They'll be really overcooked, um, but they've been a lot the stock at that point and so it's a great thing to just throw in as you're making stock today preparing for your gravy okay our next question comes to us from user fart bringer <laughs> i hope that's not what they're bringing to the thanksgiving table this year <laughs> but i see that they are in the audience so this one is for you they ask i need a replacement for aleppo pepper for a cornbread casserole any suggestions I saw something that suggested paprika mixed with cayenne, but I'm not familiar with Aleppo. Um, okay, so Aleppo is a mild chili flake. Um, and so if you can't find Aleppo, but you have something like a red pepper flake, like an Italian pepperoni red pepper flake, you can absolutely use that instead. Just know that a red pepper flake is a lot spicier, like teaspoon to teaspoon than a Aleppo pepper. So um, scale back, I would say by like um, 75%. So if your recipe calls for a teaspoon of Aleppo pepper, I would put a quarter teaspoon of a red flake um, or look for other mild chili flakes or other varieties um, out there. But I think the most commonly found chili flake that you may already have in your pantry would be a red, uh, red pepper flake pepperoncini kind of Italian vibe. So just scale back and it will accomplish a similar task. Great. We have a question from an anonymous user. What is the most non-traditional side dish you like to make or have made for Thanksgiving dinner? Hmm, good question. Um, we always do things pretty traditionally and I wouldn't say that I wouldn't say that what I'm about to say is an untraditional approach but there have been many Thanksgivings where I have foregone mashed potatoes for crispy roasted potatoes and I know that it's blasphemous because everyone thinks that mashed potatoes belong on the plate on Thanksgiving and I agree to some extent but at the end of the day for me if you're going to put a gun to my head and ask me what the what potato, what potato I want on my plate, it's not going to be a mashed potato. It's going to be a golden, crispy, crunchy on the outside, fluffy on the inside potato. And the recipe that I use um, is one that Chris Morocco did, um, several years ago, burnished potato nuggets. And they're like these big, chunky bits of russet potatoes that get boiled and then roasted in a like rosemary garlic oil um, for a really long time in the oven. And they're, they're like pretty large two or three inch pieces. And um, the method that you use for, which is a genius technique is basically like you boil them, you drain them, you throw them into a baking sheet and you shake the baking sheet back and forth 
And while the potatoes, steamed potatoes are still hot, it ends up like rubbing up and scuffing up the edges of the potatoes, which creates all of these nooks and crannies so that when you then return them to the oven with oil, they get all of the like crispy exteriors. And so for me, that is the ultimate Thanksgiving potato. It's so fluffy on the inside that it sort of satisfies the like, I need a mashed potato moment, but you get all of the browned crispy edges. And so that's kind of my untraditional um, staple on the. Um, that sounds really similar to how we make uh, roast potatoes in the UK where I'm from. Um, we do them for, we have like our roast dinner on a Sunday and we sort of bash up our, our parboiled potatoes and they crisp up and fluff in the middle. It's great. Exactly. Um, yeah, they're very yeah. like British style. And if you have it, um, frying them or roasting them after they're in some sort of animal fat. So if you have turkey fat or chicken fat, schmaltz or beef fat, is another amazing way to um, layer flavor into them and make them stand out. Great. Um, so I guess related to potatoes, um, someone has asked, let me just check. Oh, it's, uh, they have got a username. They're called Thanks A Lot. <laughs> They've asked, if Very you cute. had to pick one veggie side, what would it be? Oh my God, that is so stressful. Um, you know, I feel like this is a um, maybe unpopular opinion, but I love creamed green. Um, so I think, and, and by the way, I'm going to assume that mashed potatoes and stuffing are not veggie sides. So those are, or, or roasted potatoes and stuffing. So those are already on the table in this um, challenge where I have to choose what my side is. And I think that creamed, spicy creamed greens always get me and um i feel like they belong on the thanksgiving table and aren't always there and so if i had to choose one it would probably be that can you guys hear tuna whining by the way she's crying yeah we can <laughs> <laughs> yeah tuna. she wants to be picked Bless. up i have her oh so cute is she approve of your choice of creamed beans or, or <laughs> is that her? i don't know i mean she did she was <laughs> crying she was yelping at me during that one so maybe not speaking of perhaps funky sides we have a question from an anonymous user who says what are some funky sides that travel well funky sides. okay we love a funky side um that travels well so um I don't know if you guys or how many of you guys are familiar with um, honey nut squash, but honey nut squash is basically like a tiny shrunken down butternut squash. And um, it's a much more, it's like a much more concentrated, sweet, flavorful version of it. And they're cute because they're really small. And so you can just like cut them in half, scoop them and roast them. Um, and everybody can have like their own singular half of a squash. For me, they're like the, definitely the most flavorful, delicious squash and squash carries really well. So you can roast that in advance the same thing, the same way with like a sweet potato. Um, you can roast that in advance and bring them over. So I would maybe choose something in the squash or sweet potato department if I was traveling a distance because something in the green department like a sauteed green bean or a sauteed brussels sprout will die more quickly it's not to say that you can't make them in advance but if you're looking for something that really carries well i would say like the squash department delicata honey nut or there's a new ish squash that got introduced to um to the squash vernacular which is called um 898 squash and it's basically a even smaller more concentrated sweeter version of the honey nut squash so look out for those at farmers markets if you can find them because they're really really special and um i think would make for beautiful side dishes love a squash we have a question from tina Fay dunaway they say thank you so much for coming we are so lucky to have you between cookbook development the club and youtube how <laughs> do you stay inspired and keep things so fresh have a great holiday 
Oh, thank you. Um, how do I do it? I mean, here's the thing about what I do. As a human being, we eat, we eat two to three times a day. And so I have two to three moments every day where I am coming into contact with my medium, which is food. And so um, I stay inspired by um, two things. One, going out and eating out in the world, a huge part of finding inspiration and kind of like getting outside of my own head and outside of my own comfort zone. Because without eating out in the world and eating other people's food, my, my like, um, relationship to cooking stays very insular and can feel really repetitive. Um, and so eating out is a big part of it. But then also a huge part of um, what inspires me in my recipes in my book and online and anywhere that you guys come in contact with them is allowing myself the space to cook um, without recipes. So while I spend so much of my time thinking about food in the context of a recipe, it's so important for me to put that side of my brain away and, and shut it down and open up the fridge, see what's in there and sort of like start to cook and to start pulling things out and to improvise. And this is where that's where like, you know, probably 50% of my recipe inspiration ends up coming from it's cooking out of like necessity and out of what is what I see in my fridge and my pantry. And that those meals where I turn my recipe writing brain off, often end up turning into recipes, ironically, down the line. Um, and so so yeah, I would say like, for me, it's about like getting there and tasting other people's foods, and then allowing myself to just cook freely in a non author recipe developer mindset um, several times a week. That's really um, interesting to hear, Molly, where you get your inspiration from. I, 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 I'm always curious uh, when people I admire are really successful, like how do they do it? Where do they get their ideas? So that's, that's a great insight. Um, I'm going to ask a question from the comments. Um, Spicy Dog um, has actually asked about dessert, which we haven't covered too much um, so far in this in this talk. They've said, "What are you, what is your favorite dessert? Everything you've been cooking looks really good." So, <laughs> okay. Um, so, let's talk about pie. I. I am not, my husband's laughing at me right now because he just walked in the room and he just heard me go, let's talk about pie. <laughs> <laughs> Who did I marry? <laughs> um, bye. <laughs> um, so pie is not something that I eat on any other day of the year, but Thanksgiving, it's just not the dessert that I think about. The dessert that I think about on every other day of the year is mostly carrot cake, um, which by the way, wouldn't be the worst thing on Thanksgiving. But on Thanksgiving, I do like pie. I do eat pie. And I grew up making pumpkin pie with my dad. Um, we follow the recipe on the back of the Libby's pumpkin pie can, which is for those of you who are unacquainted, the only canned pumpkin really that matters. I've done a lot of recipe testing for this. I can tell you that not all canned pumpkin is created equally. So always get Libby's. It's the best, the most pumpkin e flavor. Um, so I grew up on pumpkin pie. Um, and so if I had to choose one pie on the Thanksgiving table, it would be that. However, we've been making the recipe from the back of the Libby's can for years. This year, I decided to try and switch things up. And so I developed a pie this year which has now become the new standard for me. Like this will be the new pumpkin pie that's on the table moving forward. And it is a mashup of a salty honey pie and a pumpkin pie. So a salty honey pie is um, basically like a chess pie. And if you guys have ever had the, there's a salty honey pie that became really, really famous from this bakery called four and 20 blackbirds in Brooklyn. Um, and it's basically a, custard pie made out of eggs honey and sugar and it's set in a pie crust in a blind baked pie crust so 
it's one of my favorite pies. It gets comes out of the oven. It gets showered in flaky sea salt. So it's a very sweet, savory kind of dessert. And so this year I developed a pie that is a mashup of that pie and a pumpkin pie. And so it eats more like a honey custard in terms of like the sort of like light, sticky, glassy texture. But it tastes like a pumpkin pie because it's spiced with cinnamon and nutmeg and fresh and it has like a little bit of canned pumpkin in there but not so much that it becomes this like thick pumpkin filling and so all this to say salty honey pumpkin pie is now my new favorite thanksgiving dessert and i think you guys should all try it this year You're speaking my language. That sounds amazing. I always love your recipes because I'm a big salt fan as well. So give me salty, savory desserts. It sounds so good. Yeah. I have a question from No Punches Pulled who asks, what are the best leftovers a day after Thanksgiving to make a meal with? Um, Well, lucky for you, I think most elements of the Thanksgiving meal are um are great the next day and that's also why i think that they're great on thanksgiving is that the things like the stuffing and the gratin and the mashed potatoes are things that can kind of like sit out and they don't get worse with time and in fact they actually get better with time and especially when it comes to your turkey so i think that the reason that people love leftovers so much is because they've sat overnight in the fridge and all of their flavors have begun to marry. And so um, I am a big fan of like the classic Thanksgiving um, leftover sandwich, Um, a really fun way to gussy it up is to stir some gravy into your mayonnaise the next day. So you turn, you like create this like, gravy flavored mayo for your stuff for your leftover sandwich um i think really the only side dish that i don't think really can stand the test of time and i don't think will be better the next day is the salad and everything else kind of like can have its own life the next day whether that be in a sandwich whether that be transformed into a pot pie i like to take like leftover root vegetables or roasted sweet potatoes or squashes or brussels sprouts chop them up and turn them into the filling of a pot pie with any pulled leftover turkey meat. I think it's also really fun to take the leftovers and turn them into soup the next day, making congee out of the turkey bones and the shredded turkey meat um, is a great way to breathe new life into the turkey legs on days two and three when maybe like you've already plowed through your stuffing and your mashed potatoes and what's left in the fridge are just like some bits of turkey and stock. Um, So yeah, I think lucky for you, most of the Thanksgiving table dishes are really sort of built for leftovers. We got a couple questions in the comments about smoking turkeys. Uh, A couple from Jelly Belly Welly Selly and W033YT. They basically want to know, how do I go about smoking it, cooking it? Should I spatchcock it? Should I keep it whole, smoke and roast in the oven? Any tips? Okay, yeah. So we talked about this a little bit um, at the beginning. But um, I think that, first of all, smoking a turkey is a great idea um, if you have the means to do so. Regardless, I would still suggest what I suggested earlier, which is to break the turkey down into its parts before smoking it. It's pretty difficult to um, manage a whole bird when it's 16 pounds on a smoker or really even in the oven. And so um, in terms of a recipe for a classic roast turkey that I think like comes out perfectly every time, I would use a recipe that's called um, expertly spiced and glazed turkey. If you Google that, it will come up. It's a recipe that Andy Baragani developed. It's kind of been the like formula that I've followed for years in terms of um, the way that the method that you cook it, which is to break it down into, you have this double breastplate, you've got two legs um, and you've got the wings and you roast them in their parts on a baking sheet in the oven. It is a, has a really good guide for how to season your turkey. So a really, really important, probably the most important part of 
turkey cookery is the seasoning and that happens two days in advance it should start today if you're celebrating on thursday um a dry brine has always been my preferred method um which means it's basically just a fancy word for seasoning a spice mix so I use a mixture of kosher salt, brown sugar, and then whatever spices I'm feeling that year. So um, you could use fennel seed or um, red pepper flake or um, cinnamon or cardamom or cumin, paprika. But if you have, as long as you have a mixture of kosher salt and sugar and you're liberally seasoning your turkey, your broken down turkey parts two days in advance and letting them air dry in the fridge. This will ensure a really well seasoned, juicy meat with crispy skin because the air drying in the fridge allows for the moisture to sort of wick away and the skin to get really taut and dry and therefore crisp in the oven. So I've said it before, I will say it again. Again, break your turkey down into its parts before you roast it. This way you can manage the internal temperature of each individual part and pull things out of the oven when they're ready and season two days in advance. Those are the two biggest pieces of advice I have for you in your turkey. Your turkey will be amazing every time if you follow those. Oh, I'm just so hungry now. <laughs> All this turkey talk. Um, I have a, um emergency question from Curry Baldak in the comments. Uh, they say, Molly, caps, all caps, I last minute need to bring something to Thanksgiving. Are the scallion rolls beginner friendly? Can I make them for the first time that day and they'll be okay? And they say, bearing in mind the only other bread that they've made is focaccia. Okay, great question. So this person is referring to a recipe that I just put out for brown butter and scallion milk bread rolls. Um, and it is a recipe that a recipe developer, Betty Lou, um, contributed to my recipe club for Thanksgiving this year. And basically, if you guys have ever had Japanese milk bread, it's a very light, fluffy white bread um, that's sliceable. And you'll see it often on like a katsu sandwich or an egg salad sandwich. Um, she's taken that method and turned it into a dinner roll. Um, and so they're these very light, fluffy white bread dinner rolls that are flavored with brown butter and scallions. Um, to the question of whether they're uh, beginner friendly, I would say yes. Um, the one thing I would caution is that I think that their um, shelf life is pretty short. And so I wouldn't make them the morning of and bring them to Thanksgiving, I would say like the closer to dinner time that you get them, the, the better. But that said, they rise in their baking pan after they've been rolled. And so what you can do, depending on how far you're traveling, is make the dough, um, let it proof, punch it down, turn it into the, the balls, roll the balls and set them in the, in the baking pan and then do your transportation in that period of time where they rise for like 30 minutes. And if there's room in the oven where you're going, throw them right into the oven when you get there. That way you have freshly baked rolls. If you can't do that and you need to bake them at home, I would just say bake them as close to the time that you're gonna eat as possible. And then flash them in an oven for like five, seven minutes at like three, three warm them. They're butter based, they have butter in the dough. And so, um, temperature as you know butter is solid and so it's important to warm a butter based roll like that in the oven to sort of like soften the fat that's in it and and warm it all, all the way through so that it doesn't eat as like a cold dry roll so I think you can do it as a first timer I would just make sure that you can reheat um, or bake on site I love that question. I also love your scallion biscuits. I've made those uh, countless times, the scallion sour cream biscuits. So I will be checking this recipe out as well. In the comment section, we have a question from Heidi Bennett. She asks, what's your favorite non-traditional activity for Turkey Day? Um, hmm. I, to be honest, don't do activities on Turkey Day because I'm always um, in the kitchen from day one. So um, I I come out of the kitchen around like 4 p.m. 
feeling really exhausted, served myself a meal, pass out. And then um, on the next day is when I come alive again. Um, but so I don't know if this is traditional or not, but tend to go to the movies on Black Friday um, and sit in a dark place where I don't have to talk to anyone and I'm not cooking and can just check out. So traditional or not, that's kind of like my one activity over Thanksgiving. Um, and I don't have it, it planned this year. So if you guys have any recommendations for what movie I should see or if there's something good coming out on um, Black Friday, let me know in the comments. Nice. I think Glass Onion's coming out this weekend, so let's all check that out, maybe. <laughs> okay, could be, could be. Yeah, so we've got a question in the comments from Pablo Meister. What's the best way to use the excess fat from the turkey in my stock without splitting it? Also, to stop stock from overreducing, is it okay to just take it off the heat and warm up when serving? Um... Yes. Okay. So first part of the question, I don't quite understand um, in terms of the fat. I would say that um, when you're making turkey stock, of course, turkey has a lot of fat on it. If you're putting like whole skin on pieces of fat into or pieces of meat into your pot, it's important to skim that fat off so that your gravy or the other things that you use it for don't have like a really oily, fatty um, mouthfeel. The best way to do that is to make the stock in advance. Don't worry about the fat um, day of while it's hot. Once the stock is made, you can strain out all the turkey parts and um, chill it. And when you pull it out of the fridge the next day, the fat will rise to the top and you'll be able to remove it like in one fell swoop. It'll be hard um, and you can just literally lift it off and you can either get rid of it at that point or you could use that to like roast some of your vegetables. So you could roast your Brussels sprouts in turkey fat or your, um, or your potatoes in turkey fat. Um, and then in terms of the reheat, absolutely make your stock in advance, cool it down, and then reheat it day of. Um, turkey stock can last for many days in the fridge. You can also freeze it. At this point, we're two days out from Thanksgiving, but next year, if you make it even a week in advance, you can keep it frozen and reheat it just gently in a pot. Um, and if the question is about whether you can reheat gravy, the answer is also yes. So if you're making gravy day before, chill it down put it in the reheat it really gently um in a pot until hot it won't break if it's well stabilized with a um with like a bermanier or something something to thicken it with flour that sounds good um i have a question from virginia in the comments um they ask any favorite pre-thanksgiving snacks so i'm assuming this is something you'd serve you know while everyone's waiting for the main event uh, on the day a uh, big fan of a deviled egg actually a friend's giving um three days ago or so um and we had planned to serve seasoned deviled eggs so basically deviled eggs where um the deviling takes the form of like a caesar salad dressing um and my husband forgot to make them. So we have um, now 16 boiled eggs in the fridge that never made their way. But I think that um, the kind of general strategy for Thanksgiving snack should be light. Um, and so, and not too many of them because we've got a huge meal ahead. So um, like a warm olive or like a platter of pickles and maybe some like thinly sliced ham deviled egg things that are like small one biters like I don't necessarily think that putting out a big cheese board with tons of bread makes sense when what's coming down the pipeline is stuffing and mashed potatoes and mac and cheese and all of these kind of heavy things so I would really think about like what are those like light bite snacks that you get at a bar and and that don't fill you up but just whet your appetite for what's to come because it would suck to fill up on snacks and then not have enough room for the main event after you cooked all day for it. Well, unfortunately, we're approaching the end of our time here, so we only have time for one last question. Quartz Baby asks, do you have 
any Thanksgiving cocktail recommendations? I do. I'm glad this one got asked. Um, my Thanksgiving cocktail is a fall spritz. So um, think of like an Aperol spritz, but um, with more sort of like apple fall flavor. So I use Averno, which is a spice. Amaro as the base instead of Aperol and instead of using Prosecco as the sparkling wine component I use um, sparkling cider Um, there's a recipe for it online if you google Molly Bob's fall spritz but um, this is also a great way to have a low a b low ish abv beverage like throughout the day at Thanksgiving so you're not like slamming old fashions all day long and then passing out before dinner the fall spritz is um, a nice way to ease your way into drinking on Thanksgiving. And it's a really, really delicious recipe and also pretty foolproof where you can set out the Amaro, set out your cider, give people a bucket of ice and let people um, pour their own drinks. Great. Now that's all the time we have with Molly Boz, but we definitely need to shout out the one person on stage who put this all together, and that is Stephanie. Stephanie, did you want to say something? Oh, my goodness. You didn't need to do that. I'm just so happy being here with you all. (laughs) Oh, gosh, I think that Molly may have... um, Oh, she's back. But no, thank you all so much. This has been amazing, and um, we're so lucky to have Pod Appetit. We're so lucky to have Molly on. Um, You all are amazing, and thank you so much to the community, too, for tuning in and joining in for all these talks. We love doing them. So keep coming back. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, Just before you leave, Molly, can you just tell everybody where they can find you everywhere on the internet? Mm. Um, Yes, you can find me on Instagram, on my Instagram handle at Molly Boz, M-O-L-L-Y-B-A-Z. You can find my recipes in my recipe club at mollyboz.com. And then you can find my cookbook really anywhere that you uh, that a book is sold. So any Amazon, Barnes and Noble, smaller bookstores, gift stores. My cookbook is called Cook This Book. And lastly, you can find me on YouTube. Um, I don't know what the URL is, but just Google Molly Boz, you'll find my page. Perfect. And you can find more of Pot Appetit Gourmet Takes on your favorite podcatcher or potappetitpodcast.com, where we release new episodes every other Monday. We'll be back for another Reddit talk soon. So stay here on r slash food for the next one. All right. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Thank you, Molly, for being here. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Have such a happy Happy Thanksgiving. (laughs) Happy Thanksgiving. Thanks for listening to Pot Appetit Gourmet Takes. We'd love to hear from you. So find us on Twitter and Instagram at pod underscore appetit. And on Facebook at Pod Appetit Podcast. You can also email us at podappetitpodcast at gmail.com and find all of our episodes on our website, podappetitpodcast.com. 